of Knox County Schools and the Social Studies Department. Let me welcome all of you. I am Brandon O'Neill, a Social Studies teacher at Fulton High School, and this is part three of the KCS at Home Summer Activity Set for U.S. History. This video is designed to provide you with a brief introduction and overview of the tasks you will complete. The purpose of these tasks are to allow you the opportunity to learn the content from U.S. history that you may have missed out on due to the onset of COVID-19. In this case, our focus is on the civil rights era, which covers the 1950s through the 1970s. So if this video is hard to understand, you can number one, turn on closed captions if available. Number two, adjust the playback speed to slow down the video. You can of course always go back as well and rewatch something. Number three, consider watching short clips, then pause, listen, and watch again. And then finally, number four, ask someone in your home to watch this video with you, stop frequently and talk to your partner about what you heard and understood. So if you are having problems understanding the video, um, perhaps due to English being your second language, these are some options for you to consider. Um, also, if you happen to have any technical issues with the video, you can always go back and reload it if you need to. So this activity set is number three for you, um, if you have been going in order. And uh, this one is designed to try to give you an overview of the civil rights era. And so um, historically, you kind of think of the civil rights era as being the civil rights movement, meaning the African-American civil rights movement. But in fact, there actually are several other social movements during this time period. And so this activity set is designed to kind of give you an introduction to um, several more besides just the African-American history one. Um, you see some of the photos here. You probably recognize some of them, of course. On the left, you've got Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, um, two of the probably the most prominent civil rights leaders of the 1950s and 60s. Next to them, you have a picture that comes from the Chicano movement, which is a movement primarily made up of Mexican-American uh, youth who were trying to um, protest for their rights as well. Next to that, you've got a picture from the American Indian movement where they occupied Alcatraz Island. And then finally, you have pictures from the feminist movement as well, which was also um, in the 1960s and in this case, the 1970s. So these activities will give you um, the opportunity to study and learn about all four of these movements. So let's try to set some context here. When we say the civil rights era, um, we're looking at different social movements. So um, first off, just in terms of the time period, we have on here 1950 to 1970, though um, it it's kind of difficult to put exact or precise years on the civil rights era. Uh, you have some historians who would argue it begins in 1954 with the uh, Brown v. Board Supreme Court case that desegregated schools. Some would say it begins earlier than that in 1945 when World War II ends and you have a lot of black World War II veterans coming home and they are you know, unwilling to you know, accept the Jim Crow system that had existed before World War II. You know, they are demanding their rights. Um, and even in terms of when the civil rights era ends is kind of difficult as well. You know, some people would say it ends in 1968 with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But, you know, many of these social movements were very active in the 1970s as well. So you're looking at a period from mostly the 1950s, but in some cases, well into the 1970s. Okay? And to truly set the context, you do kind of have to start with World War II. Um, because when World War II ends in 1945, you know, a lot of African Americans come home and they are unwilling to accept, you know, second class status. Um, during the war, you know, civil rights had uh, made some pretty significant strides forward. We saw the Double V campaign and the March on Washington campaigns, um, both of which sought to try to provide some type of equality in terms of um, hiring in the job market, particularly in war industries and in government positions. And um, so the World War II is in many ways kind of a transformational event for civil rights. You know, on the one hand, the African-American soldiers, you know, veterans had gone over to Europe to fight for democracy there. And yet when they come home to the United States, they uh, are not treated as equals. They don't have the right to vote. They, in many cases, have been segregated from society. They face the constant threat of violence. And so World War II and understanding the context of that war is very important to understanding what comes next, what comes next in the civil rights era. Um, while the civil rights movement is the defining social movement of the time period, there were several others. You know, as we noted in looking at some of those photos, you know, there are other movements going on, primarily of those of women and of course the minority groups. Um, all of them seeking to try to change the world in some way. 
And that's kind of what's meant by a social movement. You know, it's a movement of people. It's a, an, an organized group of people who are trying to achieve a, a collective end, kind of a common end. Um, they're trying to make improvements for their people in this case. So the essential question that we would like you to consider as you move through these different tasks is what impact would social movements of this time period have on the United States? You know, um, what was it about these social movements? What were they doing um, that changed America, that changed the United States, that sought to try to improve uh, American society, try to make it more equal? So try to keep that in mind. Well, how does the U.S. change during this time period because of these social movements? So let's first off try to establish um, what are the problems? What are the issues that social movements are trying to address, the challenges and the, the way that they are trying to confront them? So you've got African-Americans, particularly in the South, who face widespread segregation, disenfranchisement, and violence. Okay. The centerpiece of the civil rights era is the African-American civil rights movement. Um, that is heavily active in the 1950s and 60s. And African Americans are in particular trying to attack and confront and you could say dismantle the Jim Crow system of the South, the Jim Crow system um, that had existed since 1877 when Reconstruction came to an end. So when Reconstruction comes to an end in 1877, the South, uh, whites in the South, begin a program of what is essentially racial terror. Um, they segregated African Americans in all facets of society, you know, when, uh, not just school but it was schools, it was restrooms, it was restaurants and theaters and trains, eventually buses. Um, it was parks, it was libraries. You know, almost all aspects of public society were segregated based on race. Um, at the same time, you've got African Americans who have been disenfranchised. And what that means is they have lost their voting rights. Um, whites in the South would use things like poll taxes and literacy tests to take away their voting rights. And of course, without the right to vote, you know, what political power do you have? What political influence do you have? You know, it's uh, the right to vote that in many ways empowers people to have a say in their government, to be heard, to be listened to. So with African-Americans being denied the right to vote, they don't have the political power to, for instance, end something like segregation laws or to try to improve or try to help African-American society in the South. And then finally, the violence. You know, you see widespread lynching that takes place over a period of decades during this time period. Um, it's really, in many respects, only in recent years that um, society today has really kind of taken notice of this and tried to come to some type of grips with it, decided to try to reconcile ourselves to it, um, in large part due to the Equal Justice Initiative, which is a movement in an organization in Alabama that has tried to raise awareness of the impact of lynching. Um, it wasn't just lynching, though. You do have other widespread forms of violence, beatings. Um, sexual assaults and things like that as well. So African Americans are looking to try to um, confront all of these issues, segregation, disenfranchisement, and violence. And of course, there are other issues as well that they're looking at, for instance, um, poverty, issues of equality in the job and the, the labor market. But these are kind of the three big ones. I mean, you do have other minority groups who face similar forms of discrimination. You know, if you see the signs right there on the, on the right, you see the top one is meant for um, white versus black, but the bottom one includes Mexicans. You know, oftentimes we see segregation in not just the South for African Americans, but we see it in states like Texas and California and Arizona, New Mexico, places in the Southwest directed towards Latinos as well. American Indians, women, all of them face in many respects similar issues. They have been uh, denied equal rights in the United States, primarily due to the ascendancy of white, and then of course, in this case, and for women, white men. So we're going to kind of look at these movements one at a time, and then we'll kind of walk through uh, just what these tasks are, kind of what, what you are being asked to do, um, how you will be exploring these issues and examining them and try to analyzing them for yourself. So first off, the civil rights movement, what you may also call the African-American civil rights movement, which looks to, as we said, dismantle the Jim Crow system of racial terror. Um, it decides it seeks to end segregation, protecting voting rights, and putting an end to lynching. Of course, there are many leaders of this movement. The one, of course, you've always heard of is Martin Luther King Jr. Um, MLK was the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, sometimes you see it um, shortened to the SCLC, and his organization was determined and dedicated to a nonviolent approach to the civil rights movement. Um, they advocated for collective action. They advocated for trying to work together, you know, to form a movement where people would demand change, but they did so nonviolently. Um, but the key here, though, is it would be nonviolent civil disobedience 
So they would organize protests, things like marches and boycotts. But in some cases, though, they would purposefully break laws. That's what's meant by civil disobedience. Um, King believed that if a law was immoral, if it was unethical, if it was a sin, you know, if that law should not be a law, then he and other activists in the movement, they not just had a right to, but indeed they had a responsibility to disobey those laws. Um, we see this, for instance, in the sit-in movements where black and whites would sit at lunch counters that were segregated. And they did so knowing they were breaking laws, but in order to um, try to end these laws, they had to break them first. So I'm gonna minimize it just for a moment and we're gonna look at just the first task. So the first task just looks at kind of an introduction to uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. So if you look at the task list here, you're gonna see number one is, it says civil rights intro, nonviolent civil disobedience. And then if you click on it, you're gonna notice that um, it's not super long or anything. In fact, you can see it's just three questions. And then there's gonna be this YouTube clip you're gonna to go to. And the YouTube clip is gonna give you kind of an overview of just what nonviolent civil disobedience really is. It will give you examples of some of the tactics used. Um, you'll see lots of pictures and uh, video of the reaction that these protesters would get when they did nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, oftentimes the whites in the South, not just police forces, but citizens would react violently to these protests. And you would see things like beatings taking place, um, lots of violence towards even kids. And so oftentimes that reaction though was critical because um, if they could get that kind of reaction on television, then um, they were able to kind of show the world the, what the violence was really like. Your uh, task number two is gonna be a document analysis. And so you're gonna look at excerpts from um, a letter that Martin Luther King Jr. wrote. So this is task number two called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. So King wrote this in 1963, and this was after he had been arrested. Um, King was arrested several times um, in his career in the 1950s and 60s, you know, because he was part of different protests. Um, and in many respects, this may be the most famous piece of writing he has. Um, maybe perhaps the only other one would be his I Have a Dream speech, the March on Washington. But the letter from a Birmingham jail is actually directed towards um, white ministers in Birmingham, Alabama, where he is trying to explain you know, why um, he is leading this movement, um, why they are active in Birmingham, and why they, um, why they can't stop. You know, why they will not stop until African Americans are treated as equals, until they have achieved their goals. Um, it is very beautifully written. Um, it's also pretty um, comprehensive in King's kind of justification for the civil rights movement. You're going to see the excerpts have been broken up for you. So you're going to see them broken up into smaller pieces, kind of chunked. And then you'll have different questions that are kind of designed to check your content knowledge, check your comprehension to make sure that you are understanding the readings correctly. Task number three is going to be a Google map quest, which if you have done the activity sets for the Cold War and Nation in Transit, you have already done a Google map quest. But if we pull up the Google Doc, you're gonna see there are several questions. Um, each question gives you a, a direction in terms of what city to look at. And so of course, if you click on the map, you're gonna have different markers that are popping up. Uh, one thing for you to consider through all this is that the civil rights movement was of course centered in the South, but it wasn't just one or two Southern states, like it's all over the South. You can see markers in Tennessee and Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas. Um, and of course you see some markers up here in Washington, DC. The movement is centered in the South. Um, but even if you think beyond this Google map quest, you know, the civil rights movement was active in uh, many other places as well. So this is designed to kind of give you an overview of the major events of the civil rights movement. Um, Brown v. Board of Education is one major one. You see the Montgomery bus boycott with Rosa Parks. So as you go through the Google map quest, you should come away with a pretty good idea of just, you know, what the civil rights movement was trying to achieve and some of the major events and accomplishments that, that kind of led them to success. Task four is a little different in the sense that it is moving um, somewhat away from nonviolent civil disobedience and to kind of a new philosophy on the civil rights movement. Uh, many of you have probably studied Malcolm X before, but Malcolm X is in many respects kind of the polar opposite of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, they both had similar goals in terms of trying to help African Americans, trying to achieve some type of equality. But Malcolm X was um, much more skeptical. He was much more pessimistic about the success of nonviolent civil disobedient tactics of protest. 
And so this activity is just kind of designed to um, provide you some text for you to read about Malcolm X's life, you know, kind of how he became Malcolm X, uh, what kind of set him on the path to becoming a, a leader and uh, what eventually leads him to, or leads his ideas, I should say, to kind of lay the fo be the focus of the black power movement of the 1960s and 70s. Um, keep in mind as you're reading this that Malcolm X was a very complicated leader. Um, he is often kind of mischaracterized by some historians and some people who think that he was a violent man or he was trying to, um, you know, encourage African Americans to be violent and to, in, in their effort to achieve equality. But that's not really the case. It's much more the case that he was a, uh, an advocate of self-defense, which was not something that the mainstream civil rights movement was advocating. Um, and the mainstream civil rights movement, if you were being beaten, you were expected to kind of take it. You know, you could cover your head, of course, try to avoid injury, but you were not expected to fight back. And of course, you'll learn a lot about that in these activities. Okay, so kind of looking forward now, we'll talk about task eight in just a moment. Um, we're going to look just briefly at three other movements as well. So the Chicano movement is a movement primarily made up of mostly young, but not entirely young, uh, Mexican Americans um, centered out west in states like California. Um, these Latinx Americans struggled um, significantly with many of the same issues. You know, they faced segregation. Um, they faced a lack of job opportunities. They faced unequal wages. Um, many of them had their voting rights taken away. Um, their schools were not particularly um, good. They were not particularly uh, sensitive to kind of the Chicano culture. And so you'll learn about some of the leaders. These are Chavez. And in the task you'll do, you're going to focus specifically on one protest involving schools um, in Los Angeles. So I'm going to go to task number five here. It says Chicano Movement East LA walkouts. So if you were a uh, Mexican American in Los Angeles in the 1960s, the school you went to was probably not very good. Um, you probably didn't have any classes in Spanish. Um, there was nothing, there were no classes that were kind of sensitive to your culture. The food you ate was um, not really, the food you ate was not um, kind of sensitive to Latino culture. You faced corporal punishment on a regular basis. Um, the dropout rates were very high. The graduation rates were very low. Very few uh, Mexican-American students from these schools went on to college. And so you're going to see part of the Chicano movement was trying to make changes in schools. And this article will to inform you and kind of give you an opportunity to learn about the East LA walkouts when the Mexican-American students from across Los Angeles just walked out. Um, they protested and... You know, they're actually going to achieve a lot of their goals because they acted together rather than by themselves. Looking at the American Indian movement, um, the American Indian movement has also historically been completely, not just misunderstood, but ignored and marginalized. You know, the United States really kind of has two original sins. Uh, one of them is slavery, but the other one is the treatment and what amounts to um, the genocide almost of certain American Indian tribes. Um, those American Indian tribes that survived into the 1960s were stuck on Indian reservations. Um, those Indian reservations were actually the most, and actually continue to be today, the most impoverished communities uh, in the United States. Very high rates of suicide, very high rates of drug abuse and alcoholism, high rates of unemployment, a lack of basic services. So American Indians, kind of seeing the success of the African American Civil Rights Movement, were looking to make changes as well, to make their voices heard. And so they would carry out their own movement of protests and civil disobedience um, that would um, try to improve their conditions as well. The activity for this one, task number six, is actually going to look at the occupation of Alcatraz. So many of you have probably heard of Alcatraz. It used to be a very famous prison off the coast of California. Today, it's actually just a, a tourist attraction. And it, it was by the 1960s as well. But Native Americans occupied the Alcatraz Island during this time period for over a year, actually. And they say it says 19 months. And they were doing so to try to draw attention to the broken promises that the federal government had made to them. And they took over the island and then they issued this proclamation. And the proclamation was um, basically their demands for what, for how they could, um, for how they could uh, basically, it was an idea to just kind of show them um, the way that treaties in the past had been broken by the United States and the way that the federal government had not lived up to their 
um, to their obligations. So you're going to see it's actually quite short. There's only three questions, A, B, and C. Um, but as you look at the proclamation, keep in mind that they are trying to draw historical connections to past treaties and past issues where uh, the federal government in the United States has not lived up to it. The last movement you'll be looking at is the feminist movement. Um, it's also sometimes called the women's liberation movement. And, you know, women at this time were still not treated as equals. Uh, many people sometimes don't realize, but of course, women didn't even get the right to vote until, um, until the 19th Amendment in the early 1900s. But even here by the 1960s, women are still not treated as equals. Um, they face significant gaps in terms of wages. Um, they lack the same equal education opportunities, particularly in college. Um, they were oftentimes exploited when it came to legal issues like divorce and child support. Um, still in some states at the time that women were not actually allowed to divorce their husbands, but husbands were allowed to divorce their wives. And oftentimes when divorces did occur, uh, women were not always entitled to child support if they were the primary caregiver. Um, women were also facing um, significant domestic and sexual violence and in general, just a lack of real political power. So the feminist movement, or as we said, the women's liberation movement is an attempt to try to, uh, to try to take power back, you could say, or to try to improve their position in life and try to provide some type of gender um, equality and gender equity. The, the task you're gonna look at is you're gonna look at a primary document that comes from a book called The Feminine Mystique. Um, the Feminine Mystique was a book that was written by one of the leaders of the feminist movement. Her name is Betty Friedan. And in the book, um, she describes kind of um, the 1950s and 1960s uh, suburban housewife. And what she found in interviews she had done, but more importantly, letters that she received, was that women who were kind of told to stay home and take care of the kids and cook and clean and um, be good housewives, that many of those women were not satisfied with that type of life, um, that they wanted something more. Many of them kind of wrote to her and talked about how they felt a sense of emptiness, that they weren't really living life to the fullest. And so The Feminine Mystique becomes a bestseller, and it really um, appealed to a lot of women, and it kind of proved to a lot of women that they weren't alone in that feeling, that there were many other women living similar lives who also wanted to kind of live a more fulfilling life, something outside of just the home. You know, the idea that, you know what, their lives can mean more than just their families, they can have a life of their own as well. They could have their own goals. So as you read through this excerpt here, you see that it has been chunked up and there's only three questions. Once again, it's not super long, but the excerpts are um, specifically chosen to give you an idea of just how women um, felt as the 1960s is progressing. And I think you'll get a pretty good idea of why this would lead to the feminist movement, why this would be kind of the catalyst or the spark that would lead to it. Then finally, your last task, task eight, is um, what we call an activism project. And so what you're gonna be able to do is you're gonna try to get your creative energies flowing and try to put yourself in the place of a high school student in the 1960s who has decided to become an activist and join a social movement. And so by the time you get to this task, you should have looked at the African-American civil rights movement, you should have looked at the Chicano movement, the American Indian movement, and the feminist movement. And so these are just some of the social movements that were active during the 1960s. And so we're gonna pull up the directions for the task. Task eight, social movements activism project. I'll click on it. Okay, so let's read the directions together for a moment and then we'll kind of talk about it because there are multiple parts of the project. So it says, social movements activism project. Imagine you are a high school student living in the 1960s and you want to create a more equal and just society. You have decided to become active in one of the social movements of the time period. As an activist, you will take the lead in creating and organizing a method of activism designed to draw attention to the issues you are about, you care about and inspire change. So you have four parts here. Part one is join a social movement. Choose one of the movements listed below and write a short paragraph explaining why you chose it. And so of course listed are the four movements that you have been um, doing tasks for and that we have been talking about. And then you're just gonna write a short paragraph kind of explaining why you chose that movement. You know, what is it about that movement that has drawn your interest? What is it about that movement that you particularly care about? Um, part two now is going to be where you're gonna choose a problem. So it says, do some research on the internet. Use Google to read up on your social movement, in particular focusing on why that movement existed and what problems they were trying to overcome. So this is your chance to kind of um, take some time and explore the movement on your own. You know, use the internet, read up on it, 
um, try to go to some legitimate websites and um, read up on just what this movement's about, you know, beyond what you've done. You know, the tasks that we have done before this have mostly just been designed to give you kind of an overview or a kind of a snapshot of those movements. But these movements are huge. They took place over periods of, in some cases, decades. So take some time and read up on the movement. And then identify one problem or challenge that your social movement is trying to solve. Answer these questions in preparation for deciding on your method of activism. So these movements all have different goals and they all have different problems that they're trying to confront. Um, part two is asking you to choose one problem, just one. Pick one problem, one issue um, that they, this movement cares about and that they are trying to fix or solve or do away with, that they're trying to take some action for. And then your three questions to answer when you decide on what that problem is, is identify the problem you have chosen and explain the situation. Number two, who is impacted by the problem and explain how. Remember, if it's a problem, it must be impacting people somehow in some way that is negative, in some way that could be discriminatory. And then finally, number three, what can or should be done to solve this problem based on your research? And then explain. So um, part three now is the final part. And this is where you are going to essentially create an artifact that is designed to kind of showcase a method of activism. So it says, now you must choose your method of activism to combat this problem. Your method might be one of the following. So you could do artwork, a song, choreographing a dance, making a poster, writing a, a poem or a play. Um, remember that you know, being a, an activist could include a lot of different things. It's not just doing one thing. It's not just marching. There's a lot of different ways to protest and to, um, to try to impact and create change. You also could have a written protest. So maybe you're more of a literary minded. Um, write a speech. Could be a letter to sent to a politician or community, a pamphlet to be distributed on the street, or an editorial for a newspaper or magazine. You may also create a petition and get signatures. And then finally, an active protest. Write a detailed proposal and action plan for a protest, march, a sit-in, a boycott, or a strike. And so the last one is um, very much trying to put you in the place of an organizer. You know, when you organize protests like this, it couldn't just be done on the fly. It wasn't something that they could do instantly. Um, quite the opposite. There was a lot of pre-planning that went into these types of actions. You know, the March on Washington, for instance, is a great example. You know, it took months for the civil rights leaders and organizations to work with the federal government and to organize the March on Washington that eventually led to Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Okay. So for all three methods, you must include a written statement below that answers these questions. So once you have created either your form of artwork or your written protests or your active protests, answer these three questions. Why did you choose this method of activism? What do you hope to accomplish by protesting and how will your solution be better than what currently exists? So looking at this uh, project in total, you know, the, the idea is try to be creative, try to think outside the box, try to show empathy and put yourself in the shoes of somebody living in the 1960s. You know, if you were in the 1960s, what role would you play? How could you as an individual um, create change? How could you be a positive influence? How can you help make the world around you a better place? So those are the activities that you will be looking at, the different tasks. Um, as you go through them, once again, going back to our essential question, keep in mind what impact would the social movements of this time period have on the United States? What change happens? And also I'll add another question, which is, how does this impact the United States today? Because of the changes that were made, the achievements from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, you know, how is the United States better today? You know, what progress has been made? You know, um, the United States is a very different country today because of what took place during this time period. But also think to yourself as well, what would the United States be like if these social movements didn't exist? You know, would there still be some type of Jim Crow system active in the South? Would women still be treated as second class? Would Latinos and American Indians still lacking some of these rights? So as you go through it, try to think to yourself, try to make those connections to the here and now. You know, because as you're studying history, we don't just study history to know the past. We study the past because it tells us something about our present and it allows us to make better decisions in our future. Thank you.